Welcome to Delisters of History, the podcast about interesting people you probably didn't learn about in school. My name is Fega, and I am your end of the tourism season, but not quite blob historian. That almost worked. <laughs> and I am Issa. Today I'm calling myself, uh, I, I wrote articles in two different quick trips. Uh, so I'm calling myself a the quick trip art reporter today. Nice. And we have a guest. <laughs> Uh, David Page. Hi, David. Welcome. Welcome. David. I guess we didn't go over if you are a Dave or a David before this. Actually, I'm a David, but thanks for raising the question. Yeah. Okay. So David Page was the creator and executive producer of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, and the executive producer for 11 seasons, if I wrote this down right. Yep. Yep. And in 2000. Oh my gosh, I'm reading this all out of order. Also, Creative Food Network's Outrageous Foods, Tailgate Warriors, and a pilot for Spike TV entitled Hungry Men at Work. Yes. Uh, which I was very fond of Spike TV back in the day. Um, they don't they exist had... anymore. Another casualty of chasing demographically specific ratings. Sad. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he is the writer of a book that I have next to me, Food Americana, The Remarkable People and Incredible Stories Behind America's Favorite Dishes. So welcome. Thanks for hanging out with us. Well, um, thanks for having me. Yeah. Of so course. Not talking so much about a specific person, which is our usual thing, but more about sort of the concept of American cuisine. So um, as we are, we are all, uh, we all Jews here. <laughs> <laughs> have a bagel. Yep, yeah. that's where we're going. I'm in a Facebook group <laughs> called Doing This to Bagels is Incredibly Offensive to My People. So I have to ask, what's your bagel order? And this is a test. My bagel <laughs> order? Well, it's, it's not the one that What's Her Name from Sex in the City entered in when she was running for mayor of New York. And of course, oh, you have no. to go. You have to go to Zabar's. I, was this, yeah, Cynthia Nixon. You have to go to Zabar's or a similar store and order lox bagel and cream cheese because mm -hmm. you know there's a bunch of us in the city <laughs> a significant voting block and she was doing fine with that until uh -huh. she ordered um smoked salmon cream cheese that's fine she ordered a cinnamon raisin bagel oh which, i remember yeah. every single jew found out about this yeah, yeah, it's like mayonnaise on white bread with pastrami. Yeah. So yeah. that did not It's help. worse than that. It's worse. It's worse. It doesn't even, like, I can't even imagine if that tastes good. Like, I understand a cinnamon raisin bagel with, like, I don't know, strawberry cream cheese. Like, I get I do not understand a cinnamon raisin bagel under any circumstances. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> and, and, and it's an abomination. That. I did have uh, it. But you, you can yeah. you can actually um, thank a bunch of Jews for that one too, though the uh, the Lender yeah. Brothers, who I spoke to, I, uh, I spoke uh, to one of them for the book. When when yeah. they um, made the bagel a national commodity, um, they had to change it for uh, non New York non Jewish tastes, and they started adding flavors like cinnamon raisin. Um, and I spoke to Marvin Lender about it and said, you know, people complain they're not like New York bagels. He said, of course they're not. First of all, we, we made them in an automated process, so it's going to change them. And secondly, I couldn't sell a real New York bagel in the middle of the country. Uh -huh. And and there's a whole story behind why they're softer than New York bagels, which is tied to the fact that there's a mechanized procedure that's, that's used to make them. Yeah. Um, but as for my favorite order, it depends on what kind of locks you're getting. If I'm getting smoked salmon, uh, you know, Nova, then I go for an everything bagel. But if I'm getting belly locks, which was the first and is not smoked salmon, it's the original locks that was preserved during transcontinental shipping of salmon from 
the Pacific Northwest to the East Coast, and there was no refrigeration back then, you had to pack them in salt to keep them from rotting. So uh, that basically, um, belly locks was invented as, as you know, it's a byproduct of sending salmon east. If I'm huh. having belly locks, which is tremendously salty, then I'll have uh, probably a poppy seed bagel or even a plain bagel because there's just too much salt in it to fight with what's on and everything. Got it. Got it. And do you, I have a question that, do you have a, an opinion on Montreal bagels at all? Yeah. They're, they're not bagels. They're a wonderful thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I enjoy it. It, it, no, it's like the difference between Montreal smoked beef and pastrami or corned beef. Yeah. Um, it's not the Jewish American items item that I yeah. grew up with, but by the way, it's perfectly legit. I mean, uh, a whole bunch of Jews escaping the coming Holocaust who could not get into the United States moved to Canada, uh, mm -hmm. to specifically Montreal. Yeah. So there is an entire evolved Jewish Canadian food culture, just as there is a Jewish American food culture. Yeah. And if they want to make their bagels that way, uh, more power to them. <laughs> they are cakey. They are different to anybody who hasn't had a Montreal yeah, they're, they're bagel. Which I'm, I'm, I'm and I'm uh, them, I, I, I um, am fond of them myself. And we have yeah. I have a couple Canadians that I fight with this about on different levels because I don't know what to think at, at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm having identity identity crisis. Fine. Yeah, I, I, I love a Montreal bagel. Although I'm not gonna lie, I think part of that is because you walk in and like they have like the pile of bagels that just came out of the oven, and I think anything's at San Fierro like at the at the place. Um, yeah, at San yeah. Fierro. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So this yeah, but wait, I'll, 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 yeah. yeah, go for it. Better than bagels though are Bialis. I think My that's we have a new Bialy place in West Philly. I'm so excited. Oh really? Yeah, it I'm just com like, I'm, I'm coming opened. to Philly. Uh, I'm giving a keynote speech in Philly on September 6th. You're going to have to send me the name of the Bialy place. Yeah, sure. Well, it's uh, I don't know if it's any good, but they're called Cleo's Bagels, and they just opened, and they have a very cute storefront. Okay, you uh, tell no, me how they start. are with a stern eye, because yeah. every time a new bagel place opens in Philly, there's all these great expectations. Oh, it's going to be just like New York. It's going to be the real bagel. We're going to have real Philly bagels. The only place to get good bagels in Philly is in the Orthodox community on the edge, on the city okay. line, all the way out there. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll get you the name of that place. If you have, if you need a really good bagels in Philly, um, that is a place to go. But Bialy, yeah. I am a little bit more hopeful, but I don't want my hopes to be dashed again. It's the only thing. Well, Bialy's, you know, <laughs> since you don't have to go through the boiling and proofing stages, um, maybe, I say maybe, I, I'm, I'm not certain but maybe easier not to screw up hmm. uh, and when i when i was young my my um paternal grandparents lived on the lower east side of manhattan and my grandfather used to walk with me to kosar's bialis which was an institution um about which i'm a little worried because they hmm. were um bought out a few years back and now make bagels as well and i'm not convinced that those two items um belong in the same place because they're very different manufacturing processes but i've got to get down there and give it a shot yeah so this this actually like dovetails in really nicely uh to what was sort of my central takeaway of the book which was this question of authenticity around mm -hmm. ethnic food in america and mm -hmm. i was really struck by and i don't know if this is just the people you talk to but the um the sort of different feelings about like at what when are we upset about the quote unquote inauthenticity of it and what even is authenticity when you're talking about like well, american versions of ethnic food authenticity is pardon me a really bad word to use when discussing food you can get away with it because you're clearly a bagel lover but the question <laughs> i'm actually becomes, pretty chill about bagels <laughs> yeah, the question becomes authentic to what Food constantly evolves everywhere. I mean, you'll have people who go to a Chinese restaurant and claim it's not authentic. Well, right now, one of the most authentic dishes being eaten in China among the young and hip is scrambled eggs with tomatoes. So are, are you looking yeah. for those? Every cuisine 
that we adopted is um, has evolved and is not the original cuisine of that country, mm. but is, in fact, a different cuisine that's highly legitimate. You know, the the Mexican food developed here out of the food of the Norteños, the Mexican nationals who lived in the northern part of that country, who after the Mexican-American War in, what was it, 1848 that it ended, they suddenly found themselves as Americans because we took half of Mexico. The The connection to certain ingredients went away. Um, their food evolved as food always does, separate from that same cuisine as it was involving, evolving in Mexico. And uh, frankly, uh, as restaurants began to open, uh, these folks figured out what Americans would and would not eat. So you ended up with a Mexican-American cuisine. You actually ended up with several Mexican-American cuisines. You've got Tex-Mex, Cal-Mex, the Mexican that's served in Colorado. But uh, those are perfectly legitimate cuisines. Are they the cuisine, for the most part, that's eaten in Mexico? Or are they the cuisines that are eaten in Mexico? Because people don't realize most countries' cuisines are regional, not national. Um, What's interesting is, over the last few years, we're seeing more and more regional Mexican cuisines that had not been available in this country becoming available because of immigration here from various parts of the country and just because of culinary uh, adventurousness. Uh, For example, birria, or to pronounce it correctly, birria, which is a spicy meat stew um, that in central Mexico is generally made of goat. Um, By the time it migrated up to Tijuana long after um, the cuisine of the Norteños there became Americanized, uh, it's mostly done with beef. Uh, But it's fabulous. And and you can get it, in fact, you can get it in Philly, I forget the name of the food truck on the south side, but it's I, just Yeah, incredible. I have a bone to pick with you. You wrote all about this amazing food truck on Washington uh-huh. Ave, and you didn't yeah. say what it was called in the book. And there's yes, like I 10 did. Mexican food. There's like 10 Mexican food trucks on, on Washington Ave in that part of the city. I swear to <laughs> I'll look God, again. I did. If you're trying, <laughs> no, I opened the book when I described the truck. It's the orange food truck called the Blah Blah. I swear to God, I named it. It's a fine and Mexican if I didn't, I should be severely chastised. <laughs> um, I, mean, I might be wrong. It's that's been, another place I plan to go. Huh? I said I might be wrong. It's been known to happen. Um, yeah. If I, can I, I cannot believe that I didn't name the truck, but that's okay. Because I was like, because everywhere else I was like, oh God, like this sounds so good. And I am not going to be in that part of the country anytime soon. Um, this one it's in like, there. I swear it's in there. Come on. You can find it. Wait, I think I'm looking in the wrong part. I'll figure it out. But go to um, the Mexican food chapter. Anyway. I know, but the first chapter, but the first part of that is about Taco Bell. Yes. Keep going. Okay. Because Taco <laughs> Bell, if you haven't read my book, is what it. well, not you. I'm talking about <laughs> you do have a few listeners out there. For those who have not read the book. It was Glenn Bell, who had a hot dog stand in Riverside, California, who basically opened the door for Mexican food to become American across the country when he started Taco Bell. And it was Taco Bell that was the first outpost of Mexican food or something close to it in the Midwest, certainly, and and heading east. And once Americans got a taste of that, they were more receptive to uh, shall we say, more extensive Mexican restaurants opening up. You are still... I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm going to get up and get a copy believe, of the damn book. Oh my God, it's fine. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I, I did want to say yeah. I loved that image you had of the Taco Bell closing because I went to college in a very small town in Northeastern Ohio. Isa looks like she's having a moment. Uh, <laughs> um, in Northeastern Isa's Ohio. laughing at us. Uh, in Northeast Ohio, and the I only am. place that to go get anything after like I don't know, like six o'clock, was either Applebee's or Taco Bell. So I have a lot of like really fond memories of like sitting on the curb on Bell Avenue. My God, I didn't Bell name it. Page forty-one. 
Here in Philly, there's a lot of people from Pueblo, she says. My father as well, but it isn't what she and her family are serving to customers from their silver. I didn't name the truck. It's the something de Puebla tacos. It may just be Puebla okay. tacos. I think I know where that is. I think that's. I am duly Puebla. chastised, madam. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to go find it. I will apologize it. to them uh, on the 6th when I stop by there to bring some video home. Yeah, I'm going to have to go there now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This this went off the rails from where I was going, but that's okay. Well, off the uh, rails? We're in Cleveland. Yeah. We've, yes. we've gone 100 <laughs> miles from where we were. So there's the rails, and then there's like my approximate rails that I kind of have in my brain, and then we're like way over there. Um, it's okay. Yeah. So we're just going to go find some new rails. So you brought up what is Chinese food and talking about how like what's popular with young mm-hmm. people in China is like scrambled eggs. And I've, I, I'm sure we've all seen on social media, these, what do they call it? White people food. I forget what they call it. I, for, I forget the QC. I don't know what you said. If you remember the cutesy term they have for it, but it basically is like for like white people food where they, when white. they have just like the, the sandwich and the like, so they'll have these meals that they'll post on social media. And their whole thing is that like, American food or white people food is like supposed to be so much simpler to make and it's like supposed to be like freeing because you can like use your brain to like do something else in the day and so but they'll post these hysterical like a bento box with like a carrot and like two pieces of bread with some peanut butter. Is this a are these white people or are these people making fun of white people? They're making fun of white people. Okay, I I have not I have not seen this. All I know is white people food, girl dinner, and which is a whole thing. Um, yeah, here we go. It was on NPR. White people food is trending on Chinese social media. Oh, that's wild. And so the reason <laughs> the reason I bring it up is because the it's always it's very funny from my perspective because it looks like no lunch I've ever had in my life. <laughs> because I well, and, and, so, and that's what I sort of and, th- and so that brings me to back to American food then is like I guess I just want to talk about this sort of interchange between like perception and reality I mean General So's chicken I think is a good example of this of how much of what changes is like innovation from a perspective of like I'm trying this new thing and I'm excited versus how do we make this palatable to you know, white American palates or whatever, um, or just, I have a weird perception of what this is. Well, there's a tremendous amount to unpack there. I mean, yeah. General Cho's chicken as um, modified in the United States to be sweet, sticky, and boneless, as opposed to the original that was invented in Taipei, which was tangy on the bone um, and not sticky. Hmm. It, it, it's what American tastes chose to want. And mm-hmm. I'm not even sure that chose is a fair term because mm-hmm. uh, we've become kind of addicted to certain flavors and, and, uh, and minerals. But, you know, you talk about seeing a simple plate of food and making fun of that. Um, I'm kind of on a soapbox lately about the virtues of cooking good food and the fact that it takes less time to do that than, for example, to use one of those insane meal kits or to get (laughs) frozen meals that are supposedly great and then you have to take them out, you have to defrost them, Mm -hmm. you got to slip the the cellophane. I mean, and by the way, when I say real food, I don't mean organic. I don't mean you got to go to Whole Foods. Just just Mm -hmm. get a hunk of food, like a a chicken. You Mm -hmm. know, You, you put it in a frying pan. You rub salt, pepper, and garlic on it. You pour a little stock in, which you got in a box. You put it in a 500-degree oven for 40 minutes, and you have an incredible meal. It it ain't that hard. And this, we're so into time-saving. You know, this began in the, well, earlier, but really um, bloomed in in the 50s. There's a great book called Paradox of Plenty, uh, written by a Canadian academic on, on this topic, which is convenience foods will save you time. It comes in a can. Mm-hmm. It comes frozen. And in fact, to get housewives 
because that's what they were back then, to get housewives to try this stuff, they realized they had to make them feel like they were cooking, which is why condensed soup required water added. Hmm. Or pancake mix required an egg hmm. added. Hmm. The original scientific uh, recipes for those required nothing more than water, but there was uh, resistance to feeling as if you hadn't done anything. But this this whole sense of using processing or some kind of secret shortcut to eliminate cooking time is insane. I mean, last night, my wife and I had phenomenal steak dinner because, A, we went to a butcher and bought good meat, B, we reverse seared it. Do you know what that is? No. Do you know what sous vide is? Where you, okay. Reverse sear has you cooking meat at a very low temperature. Usually, if you're going to cook a steak, you get a really hot pan and you throw the steak on it on one side, then you turn it over, believing that this will somehow sear it and keep the juices in, which chemically isn't true, but what the hell. In the process of doing that, you create a well-done layer around the sides of the meat. There's no way that it can be pink from side to side. In a reverse sear situation, you put it in the oven. I use 270 or 275. You cook it there until it's almost done. You take it out. You throw it in a hot pan for two minutes on each side. Then you take it out, and you've got almost an entirely pink piece of meat. That's huh. all, the, aside from putting salt and pepper on it, that's all the work that's required. It's a lot easier than, than trying to open one of those meal kit packets full of pepper. <laughs> so my mom, my, my mom's a chef and we've been talking about this since the day I was born and that, that cooking is actually so much more, so much easier. Cooking a good meal is so much easier than celebrity chefs will actually even like have it will show, will, will show the, the way that that the food network even I guess a lot of places um, depending on the show will will make it seem um, and so she she owns a small cooking school called the fake cooking school where they do these you know three hour long classes they vary in difficulty there's some that are like advanced level but most of them are just like really 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 simple and the but by the fifth I used to help her out in class and by like the 10th time we did the especially with steak steak is so easy <laughs> like by the 10th time we did the steak class that's the easiest one it's the most popular one the yeah. actual cook prep for the meal takes like the actual steak takes like five minutes it's crazy at most. like yeah at most and so that you don't want to cook it for longer um but it's uh it's a really interesting thing the way that we do not learn these simple, simple, simple techniques. Um, and it, it's one of the craziest things. There's something else with cooking, though. Unlike baking, wh which is a science. I mean, if it says mm -hmm. a quarter teaspoon and you use a mm -hmm. half, it's ruined. Yep. Yep. Cooking, cooking's an art. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be what the recipe said. It doesn't have to yeah. be perfect. Occasionally, yeah. I'll, I'm the cook in the family. Occasionally, I'll serve dinner. My wife will look up with a look in her eye saying, not so good tonight, huh? Right? Well, not you've your done best. better. You know, it, it happens. And you don't have to be a natural. If I'm inviting people over for dinner, let's say for steak, and there's four of mm -hmm. us, I get mm -hmm. a fifth steak so I can keep cutting into it and make sure it's right. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. have to. Chefs have innate abilities to know when something's done. I don't. Yeah. I'm an eager amateur cook. Do what you mm -hmm. need to do. It's fine. Yeah. 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 David, I don't know how many of these you've watched. Um, Faga, I'm sure you've seen too many of them, but on, especially on Instagram and TikTok, they'll have these, the, like the ways that they um, like people show like recipe videos where they don't show, they don't talk it through. It's just like this very, very fast pace. You just see hands and it's like, chop, chop, right. chop. They're, I blah, love blah, 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 blah. They're really fun to watch, but people are starting to, they're starting to ruffle people's feathers because they don't really teach you how to cook. Like they don't really teach you like the, yeah. the background of what, of what happens there. And it kind of, to me, they overwhelm me. They're like, I'm like, I'm never going to do that. I hate to cook. So I'm like, and so I, I will only do it when my partner would, when Ben kind of like, when he gives me very precise instructions on what to help him chop and everything. And to me, when I watch those things, I'm like, 
that'll never happen in my kitchen. <laughs> like this 30s, how could one person possibly do all of that? Um, See, and so I, I love them because I kind of know how to do stuff. So it gives me ideas. Yeah. Fair. Like, oh, well, I I, look, when it comes that, to cooking, like... ideas are the most important thing. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, it's like, give it a try. What could go wrong? Well, everything. You'll eat something else. You'll walk around. What the hell? Yeah, I've had a few meals that went wrong. Um, <laughs> my, my wife likes to tease me because she's like, you look up a recipe and then you change everything. And I'm like, I mean, yeah. Well, why <laughs> That's not? The fun part. <laughs> um, she's a baker. So, uh, <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Like, that is natural. Yeah. 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 You're very um, lucky you have one cook and one baker in the family. It's how it's. I've it's... learned how to make challah. I can do that. Yeah. And I can make hamakasha. Do you braid it? I really don't know anything else. Uh, I mean, yes, but not in any of the fancy ways. Like, I just make three things and braid it like it's hair. Um, okay, with hamantashen. Also... You... Actually, hamantashen. So, hamantashen, I have this. Uh, cookbook that like says to put the the little rounds in the freezer before you form them and it's like a hmm. game changer huh really what do you do yeah. you do poppy seed filling because as far as i'm concerned that's the only acceptable hamantashen um i am rarely prepared to make hamantashen like usually i look at my calendar and go oh shit perm's coming up and so i use whatever jam i happen to have in my pantry <laughs> So that has. Yeah, you could probably use Nutella. Like apricot. Uh, oh, I have chocolate. Good. I had like a chocolate fig one year. Um, that was Fig's during the pandemic good. when when I during the pandemic I actually was prepared because I had nothing else to do but to think about what I was going to put in the hamantaschen. Yeah, but um, to me, <laughs> hamantaschen should cause you to fail a drug test at work. <laughs> and that's got to be poppy seed. <laughs> that's good stuff. Speaking of hamantaschen, we one very fun. I don't know how much time you have spent in the what's how much time you've spent in the Italian bakeries in South Philly, but they not, a, not many, enough. Not enough. Not enough. Many of them, many of them sell hamantaschen throughout the year, and and they and 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 one there was one time we've been trying to get like more of the story of like I, I think the story is probably pretty simple that like that. There used to be a ton of Jews in South Philly. Now there are fewer. We are growing in number, um, but we are multiplying. But the but the the at some point they you know Jews there was a market for hamantaschen around mm-hmm. Purim, and then the 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 Italians started making them, and then they liked them, and so that now it's like a thing you can get all throughout the year in like tons and tons of mom and pop bakeries like throughout South Philly, and they're pretty good. They're pretty good, um, but it's a beautiful thing. It is. Absolutely. Yeah, I love these, like, intersection of cultures. Like, talking about Hala, one thing that I always think about is, um, so Issa's partner, Ben, and I went to, like, summer camp together, and we've been friends for a very long time. And he introduced me to some folks out in East Kentucky, so where he used to do some some community organizing. And the one of the people down there her name's Gwen she's a delight and she runs a brick oven baking I don't know what you would call it because they make pizza and they make bread and they make all kinds of stuff Mm -hmm. in this brick oven and she was talking about how she'd been trying to make challah but like she it wasn't really working out for her and I said well I bet my wife would share her recipe we sent the recipe she's she's been making this recipe since then but she changed it a mm-hmm. little bit, and she instead of putting egg on it, she puts honey, and they call them hillbilly honey buns. That's what they. Call. And well, last, that and it's, good. I know, <laughs> and it's really sweet. Like last time I was in East Kentucky, she gave me one, and it was I was so charmed because it was. She said, "Oh yeah, the the girls have been getting really into learning all the different like, uh, braiding techniques," and she handed me like it was a circular one, and. Uh, I was like, oh, it's cute. It's like, it's Rosh Hashanah. And I explained to her that usually we do the circular ones at Rosh Hashanah. Uh, and at first she was embarrassed. I'm like, don't be embarrassed. It's like, it's like getting Christmas cookies in July. Like it's, it's great. Like, <laughs> it's fine. you know, yeah. for Rosh Hashanah, if she's got honey in there, she should put in some apple slices. And you've Ooh, got yeah. it in one place. I should send yes, her a text. But I just love these, these, and I feel like it's a quintessential American thing. Like these moments where you bring people bring these foods to two different people and something else comes out of it. And that's one thing I loved in the book when you talked about like Japanese food, Mm -hmm. because I felt like with some of the chapters, there was 
you know, you talk to people who are from that culture and there's a little like a little discontent, like Jews don't tend to think very highly of lenders, for example. Um, but right. in the in the Japanese food chapter about sushi, like I was intrigued by all the people of Japanese descent who were like, yeah, I am. I am all in on this like American thing with the rolls and the hmm. and the thing. I thought it was yeah, fascinating. Remember, most of the um, most of the folks in the book who were really excited about their sushi place, uh, in terms of the kind of sushi you can get in Japan, were in areas where the car industry has plants owned by Japanese companies. And in one particular case, the the president of one of the plants, I can't remember if it was, a, I think it was a Honda plant, but I could be wrong. Anyway, she acknowledged that while it wasn't in writing, it was acknowledged that for them to come to that town, there had to be the availability of legitimate Japanese food and products. Huh. Uh, yeah, no, that if if we're going to send a bunch of executives to to work in Alabama or Ohio. Um, we don't want it to be a hardship posting. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <gasps> That's so cool. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. And that was mind blowing for me because years ago I was in Alabama and I got like the best sushi of my life. And I was like, what is happening right now? And I realized <laughs> well, there must have yeah. been a Toyota plant nearby. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think which company is in Alabama. Um, I was I in Tescumbia, if that helps. Uh, I can't spell it. <laughs> <laughs> I I, i'm not I sure but yeah no it, <laughs> and what's weird is you know even dishes that have long been american if you will are moving out of their regions and are now available everywhere for example there's nothing more striated than barbecue i mean mm. In uh, in Kentucky, there are different kinds of barbecue depending upon mm-hmm. where you are. The same in the Carolinas. Um, you know, Texas brisket would never be served uh, in the American South. Now um, you can get most any style, most anywhere, and and I'm not sure how I feel about that because I used <laughs> to love the concept of when I go someplace getting mm-hmm. something I can only get there. Um, and I'd argue that in most cases, it's probably still better in its hometown. But, you know, there's a place in Chicago called Smoke, run by a nice Jewish guy, Barry Sorkin, uh-huh. who, before opening it, literally took a tour around the country with his compatriots to try the different kinds of barbecue and he opened with a menu of various regional kinds, and he's a huge success, and he does it well. Uh, on the other hand, I defy anyone to make a better brisket than I'll find in Central Texas at uh, Louis Miller's in the small town of Taylor. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how much it, of it though do you think is like regional vibes? Like, there's something about being mm-hmm. in the place. No, there's a lot of it. Louis Miller's. Is now it's a seventy some odd year old former girls gymnasium, uh, two oh, stories okay. tall. It. They haven't cleaned the smoke off the upper story cathedral windows that's the trick. forever. Yeah, the smoker that's the trick. itself is sixty or seventy years old. Of course, that contributes to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's just because I'm a I'm a I'm an alta caca. You know, it's yeah. I like that stuff. <laughs> Well, you're in good company here. Yeah. Speaking of hyper, oh yeah, hyper local uh, traditions. I don't know if you've ever ever eaten with anybody that keeps Memphis kosher, but we have. Uh, I we assume have a- it involves pork. <laughs> it involves pork. <laughs> it will be the entire. We're actually that's the friend's house we're at right now. Who's from? Who's from Memphis? Where they'll their their family will keep kosher the entire meal, and then the ribs come out afterwards. It's similar to flushing kosher. (laughs) My grandfather, who kept kosher, used to take me to Chinatown in New York. He claimed that when he was, I think, did I put the story in the book? No, I don't think I did. He claims that when he claimed he's passed away, that as an assistant attorney general of New York State, he ended the Tong Wars, the, the gang wars in Chinatown by convening a summit meeting and threatening to deport everyone. 
I've never fact checked this because it's such a good story. I want it to be true. Mm -hmm. Anyway, (laughs) he was legitimately, for whatever reason, an honored guest on Mott Street. When we would go downstairs into one of these places, he was a star. And he always ordered shrimps and lobster sauce because, as he said, it's really chicken. My (laughs) grandmother, who could be a kind of shitty person from time to time, got got annoyed by this. And one day they're in the restaurant. She calls the waiter over and says, what's in this? He says, well, shrimp and lobster. My grandfather could never eat it again. It was his favorite Chinese oh, no. dish. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. There is a certain type of, of denial of New York Jews that, you know, you, that yes, it's, it's kosher or it's fine, or it's not really pork when it very clearly is pork. Specific. Specifically in, don't Chinese ask me food. specifically in Chinese food. Specifically in Chinese food. It is only, that is the only time it's okay. And my, my grandparents did the same thing. Um, and well, you know, yeah, the, we- the connection <laughs> between Jews and Chinese food is real and based on prejudice or lack thereof. The uh-huh. Chinese, when they opened, well, when Chinatown grew in New York City, the Chinese had been tremendously discriminated against on the West Coast. And th- throughout the country as well, but they were aware of what it's like to to be unliked, and they had no problem with Jews. They had no problem with African Americans. So they welcomed both of them into these restaurants. And the term I think I used in the book is safe traif. When you cut mm. something up into very small pieces and hide it under a brown sauce, uh-huh. it's easy to convince yourself you're not doing anything wrong. While at the same time, for this immigrant group of Jews, eating in a Chinese restaurant was seen as a step toward positive assimilation. So it was like the perfect storm. Um, And you know the the old joke, right? The Chinese guy talking to a Jewish guy, he says, you know... Our, our culture is 4,000 years old. And the Jewish guy mm-hmm. says, our culture is 5,000 years old. And the Chinese guy says, where did you, did you eat for 1,000 years? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that is awesome. That's awesome. I I literally, I won't go on a rant on it now, but it's just, I've, I'm writing an article right now about the Eldred Street, Eldred Street Synagogue of Eldred Street Museum in New York, which everybody should go to when you're in New York. It's the, it's the yes. museum. It's my opinion. It's the museum to go to because you get to step into the first grand house of worship that Ashkenazi Jews built in the country. Um, but it's also like stepping into a Victorian synagogue from the 1800s. It is absolutely spectacular. But it's also on a a quite a bustling and beautiful street of current Chinatown, which has all of the wonderful right. density and complexity that was created in the Lower East Side originally by Jews. And then, and then they, and then the, the Chinese folks, mainly Chinese folks came in uh, and now Puerto Rican as well. Um, and so they, the museum does an amazing job kind of bridging all these cultures together and is now not there very specifically. We're not a Jewish museum. We're just the museum on Eldridge street. And we do all of this stuff. Um, and it's such a beautiful, and so researching for that article, I started finding all of these fascinating ways in which and anti-Semitism and, and, and racism against Chinese people are so intertwined and also how, you know, where there's times where we've really banded together and that's the restaurants is one of the, the biggest, the biggest versions of that. And there are times when, look, everyone's got racists. My grandmother, I mentioned, I Mm -hmm. heard her bitching to my grandfather one day, they lived on the Lower East Side and she was complaining about the Chinese encroaching Mm -hmm. on the neighborhood. My grandfather looked at her and said, you know, when our parents came to this country, they didn't even know what a bathtub was, you know, mm-hmm. get over mm-hmm. it. But, um, you know, there, there's wonderful things about cultures commingling and sometimes yeah. there's, it doesn't go that well. Yeah, um, absolutely. But damn, it's good food. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> so even when it doesn't go that well, um, I've been seeing a lot of talk about, especially Asian American food particularly, but I think this exists with a lot of ethnic food. Um, I've seen a lot of Asian American influencers sort of reflecting on their relationship with food as first generation Americans who would bring their food to school and get teased for it. Mm -hmm. Like, and now it's like very in vogue. Mm. Um, Well, yeah, it's having a moment. Yeah. Yeah, Um, So I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. And like these sort of this, these sort of questions of like, at what, 
point, like, you know, when, when, when some, I don't know, some, some white guy in Boston opens up a Vietnamese place, you know, like, where is, where is that? But, but where is that line? Like, where, 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 where does it become well, yeah, American it, it, versus Chinese or whatever? Well, here's, here's what you shouldn't do. Andrew Zimmern, the celebrity chef, opened a Chinese restaurant in Minneapolis and was quoted in the paper basically saying he was going to teach Midwesterners how to eat something other than shitty Chinese food. Mm -hmm. Like, here's I have a fat, issues with that. <laughs> yeah, here's the fat Jew that. in the Midwest claiming ownership of what is or is not acceptable Chinese food. That's, you know, it, that's, you get into when, when, I'm not sure I like the term ethnic anymore, but there's there's no functional term that replaces it. When people who are not of an ethnicity put themselves up as experts in a particular kind of food, I get a little troubled. Um, mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world. I mean, Rick Bayless, for example, has been tremendously helpful in um, uh pushing forward the idea of Mexican food from various Mexican regions. Right. And he occasionally takes shit because he's an Anglo. But Rick has always credited the Mexican chefs from whom he learned this stuff right. um, and whose knowledge he is passing on. I'm okay with that. It's a nuanced thing. It's um, It's like... When you're talking about Minnesota, speaking of places where I was un unexpected, like I remember I used to have a job that sent me to the upper Midwest with some regularity. I'm sorry. And my, I know, right? And my hey, favorite. Hey, it's great favorite, here. I like it. I like it. I'm a, I was just at I'm the fair like today. It. I'm cold. living it up. Um, Look at this. I got, I have a t shirt from the, from like my Wisconsin motel that we stayed at. I'm a, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> my, my absolute favorite. Vietnamese place in the country and mind you I live in a city that has an area called Little Saigon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota nice great, that means a Vietnamese family that ended up yep. in Sioux Falls opened a restaurant yep, right. and it's fascinating well. because like at the time when I first interacted with that I was like why is this here and yeah. I learned about like the, uh, like the Lutheran churches bringing refugees in after like it's the like the Hong population in the Twin Cities. Yeah, yeah, yep. I mean, did it's you see me, what's, what's the movie? Uh, Green Torino. I've heard the, it. Oh, I haven't. Yeah, it was a. a yeah. It's a great movie. You ought to see it. But it's centered around Hmong immigrants. Uh, in that case, I think it was Detroit. But same thing. I mean, they, they were sent uh, to cold places where they hmm. could get sponsored. Um, now. What what I would want to know about your place in Sioux Falls is where the hell do they get that bread? Do they mm. make it themselves? Because maybe that's why it's you know, so good. The, the, See, I only well, had the I, pho, so oh, okay. <laughs> not, my, not my not my favorite dish for some reason. I actually I don't know why. can't remember if they even had bon me. They might have just passed. They might have just like not had bon me if I remember. Correctly. I remember their kid. Um, they, their kid, I remember, would run around between the tables, which I remember that was the moment that I was like, okay, this is like, I walked awesome. in and I saw the kid like zooming around the restaurant. They had like the history channel with like hillbilly, uh, hand fishing on the TV. And I'm like, this is, this is, those are I two good signs. Oh, yeah. Well, look, family restaurants, family restaurants are a wonderful thing. I mean, uh, yeah. the place I included in the book that's, uh, here on the Jersey Shore um, that makes phenomenal mole, it's because mm. his wife and her mother came from Puebla, yeah. which is known for mole. Yeah. And it's her recipe, and they make it a couple times a week. And they smother um, a couple of perfectly adequate chicken breast fillets with it, and it's unbelievable. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. And by the way, I have a feeling that in a few years it will differ significantly from the mole yeah. she made back home because of what she can or can't get, um, which doesn't make it inauthentic. It makes it hers.
Yeah, I love that. There's actually, if you haven't had it, South Philly Barbacoa, they won some I have not. It, award. Um, is it is it goat or beef? Beef. Um, but it's very good. I mean, I don't. I've heard I've many never, good things about it, but I have never actually been because the lines always too long. <laughs> it's not cabeza, right? It, it's it's not uh, it. um, cow head. No, I don't think so. But I don't know. Yeah, the Yum. lady, she's from that part of Mexico. And it's this fantastic story um, where it's like she came up to the United States to pay for her daughter to go to nursing school. And she was working like dishwashing, like seven days Aye. a week, 12 hour days kind of deal uh, because mm -hmm. she didn't speak English. And she met this Jewish guy, fell in love. They got married. She's uh, for some, and because they got married, but while she was undocumented, apparently she still can't get documented, which is an absolutely bizarre. What? Huh? Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember the whole story, but I remember Send being her like, back to her immigration lawyer. Cause that doesn't sound right. Yeah. Well, she's won like a James Beard award or something. So I'm sure she's, uh, she's probably she's, pretty she's, good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, I might have the the award wrong, but one of those well known food awards she is she has won. Um, but it's it's fantastic. It's worthwhile. Um, and there's a restaurant next door that doesn't have the barbacoa necessarily, but they have like other. It's owned by her. Right. It's other Mexican food. Um, it's quite good. So I'm wondering, uh, how hard was it to decide what examples of various cuisine to pick from the book? Because I know, like, as someone who used to live in Northeast Ohio, I was. Perhaps not surprised, but a little sad not to see Barberton chicken uh, in the fried chicken section. <laughs> um, uh, which which so chicken the, the, place? Barberton chicken. This is extremely regional. Is so this the two chicken it. joints across the street from each other or in the same town? There's like four or five of them, but they're like Hungarian yeah. immigrants who make uh. this bananas fried chicken that's like fried yeah. in lard. Well, and look. the whole thing. It's the sides. It's the sides that make a barbiton chicken, though, because you have hot sauce, which is actually kind of like a Spanish rice kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. There's white bread always in the middle of the table. Um, oh, my God. It's been so long. There's something else, too, besides hot sauce. Well, the answer to your question is I, I went with fried chicken out of the South because that's where it Look was like born it. in America. Um and that's where it has played a significant role in regional cuisine. And because, frankly, um, I wanted to include the story of the uh, freed female enslaved people who made their first money by selling chicken, <clears throat> pardon me, at railway stops Um and also because you know there there's um, princes there's it, it, it's a story that that yeah. really had to come from there. The answer to how I picked things was a arbitrarily. That's what's cool about being an author. And <laughs> b I took a long look at what is part of our everyday cuisine. Hmm. Uh, you know I included Japanese because. You can buy sushi at the 7-Eleven. I did not include Vietnamese because while it is still popular in many places, it's not an everyday let's go grab it staple. Um, the two things that I left out, I did not do hot dogs because you don't cook them. You, you just heat them up and throw a regional sauce on them. And I didn't do beef per se, and perhaps I should have. Um, you Talk know, more about the, that that beef thing. When you say beef, like what are you thinking of? Well, I mean, I did hamburgers, but when I say beef, um, steak, pot roast, rib roast, you know, the the basic steak and potatoes meal that for the most part we uh, we took from England. I mean, it had an antecedent. Uh, you know, you can't you can't include everything. My uh, my nod to myself was throwing in caviar, which isn't really an everyday thing, but I was fascinated by it. That was a great that, story. Um, could you like you. just recount like sort of the the? Because I was shocked by this. Like I I grew up. This is everyone's gonna find out. Something about me. I grew up eating caviar, um, <laughs> and well, so you I. Should. <laughs> um, but it was I. I had no idea the story. Could you like give sort of like the 
the nutshell version of that? Sure. Well, uh, caviar um, comes from a particular kind of sturgeon, the um, best known or, or the supposedly highest rated is the beluga sturgeon, which uh, is naturally found in the Caspian Sea, uh, bordered by Russia and Iran. And um, that was considered the best in the world until overfishing and pollution uh, caused such a grave decline in the sturgeon population that by international fiat, uh, it's no longer legal to bring beluga caviar into the United States or any place else. Uh, there's a guy who managed to smuggle a few live beluga sturgeon out of Russia uh, just before the edict took effect. And he started a caviar farm uh, down in Florida. And huh. at this point, to the best of my knowledge, he's still the only person able to produce legitimate beluga caviar uh, wow. in the United States anyway. Now, what's interesting to know is that before Russia cornered the market, the largest producer of caviar in the world was the United States huh. um, out of, for example, the Delaware River. But we overfished and polluted that and it went away. Uh, now, uh, there's there are various kinds of caviar raised here in the U.S., um, Spain, Israel, uh, having worked in the Soviet Union for many years as a journalist, I'm quite fond of caviar. And they're all good. Uh, you know, it's that's one of those snob things. You know, this isn't <laughs> quite as good. Good God, man, it's caviar. <laughs> I get, it's all, it's all pretty good. Pop <laughs> in your mouth, have a shot of vodka and shut the hell up. <laughs> Yeah, we always had American caviar mostly because that was what was in the sort of financial realities of life. It's perfectly fine. How how often did you have caviar? Yeah, mm-hmm. how often was it? Yeah, how often? For special occasions. Go, well, was nice. Yeah, like special occasions. It's um, worth it. It's worth it because you don't need that much. Like you don't need to go- You don't need to like a plate full of caviar. You know, like you oh, get no, a little. No. From Casablanca, the scene where the evil German officer is eating caviar with a spoon out of what looks like a <laughs> half pound tin. What better I way to represent. I see those tins in real life. So, so I had a family what... member who is ludicrously wealthy and he would purchase those tins. It was wild. <laughs> yeah, but I assume he knew enough to use mother of pearl or plastic. It looked oh, oh, to me spoon? like, yes. yeah, yes. looked to me like Major Strasser may have been using metal. Yeah, which is, you know, no, no. Um, no, no. no the, the story of, of me and caviar is I was at this, we would go to this this relative's house for Thanksgiving every year. Who He was a concert pianist who realized he could make more money on the stock market than as a concert pianist. Um, mm-hmm. And had done that extremely successfully. And so he would get these like ridiculous huge things of caviar. And I was like, I don't know. 11 or 12 and I ran into I I was one of those kids my sister and I were always the only kids there so my parents would like try to keep us corralled in another room um but I always was more interested in the adults and what they were talking about and so I go in to where the adults are and I like scoop up this big piece of caviar and put on one of those little toast things um and like I don't know I think I threw some onions on it because I figured that'd be a really strong taste and ate it and somebody said to me like oh do you like caviar and I said no uh but I'm told it's an acquired taste so I'm going to start acquiring it (laughs) (laughs) and now I uh (laughs) my 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 wife and I made the mistake when our daughter was was young of allowing her to taste caviar and a sip of Chateau de Chem. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, she early on developed a palate that she certainly cannot fund. Uh, <laughs> so that this, this, this is also a girl who at the age of, I don't know, 12, we said, where, no, 16, we said, where do you want to go for your birthday? She said, WD-50, Wiley Dufresne's Molecular oh Gastronomy Temple in New York. So um, be, caref- be careful what you teach your kids. <laughs> no, 
that's amazing. What I love about this is like all the like just the feelings people have around food. Like I found reading my book, I was remembering all these like really fond memories I have around mm-hmm. these various types of food. And I'm sure we all have the same story of I, I happen to live just a few blocks from where my grandmother grew up in West uh. Philly. And, uh, you know, the story of going to the fishmonger on 60th Street to get mm. the carp and like put mm. it in the bathtub. But in the, that that wasn't me, but it was uh, my wife's family and my grandmother. Yeah, and then you then you kill the damn fish in the bathtub. Yeah. Oh my god! Uh-huh. Wow. It's just, I don't know if I have a question around this. I just love this. Like, food gives us a lot of feels. In oh, a lot it of does. Ways. Look, food is in the broadest sense the great social lubricant. It is also, I mean, I think I'm, I don't know if I put this in the book. Uh, my daughter, from the age of like eight, I'd be mumbling some reminiscence of some place I'd been. And she asked me, Dad, how come every time you talk about some place you went, you talk about the food? But it's the kind of memory that just sticks yeah. with you. You know, it just, you can't smell, help it. Smell and taste. There's some type of smart, you know, intelligent uh, studies on this, but that smell and taste will stick with you way longer and with a lot more poignancy than sight or hearing or other other senses. There's something about when you smell something that that and it transports you together. back. Like, yeah. I have this great experience with actually with Ben, he's his partner. Uh, years and years and years ago, we were in Hoboken, Georgia, which is like literally you like trip and you're in Florida. Mm -hmm. and we were there for shape note singing because we're big nerds and we were it was just one of those places that as east coast jews you're kind of taught like to drive a little faster when you're going through instead of spending the night which is what we did yeah um and it was you know like the family lived on this compound with lots of double wide trailers and stuff and the sister had invited us over for lunch and we were like great let's do it and we went over there and i had just started like i had just decided i'm not gonna eat pork anymore because i grew up didn't i didn't keep kosher growing up and i just made that decision for myself and we walk in and every single item on the stove had a ham hock in it had like a whole pig's foot and uh at the time ben also wasn't eating pork and we just kind of looked at each other and served up you know, like, and I, I love right. that story because it's just like, it's that, th- that trip was so important to me because I learned so much about my fellow Americans mm-hmm. that are so deeply different from me. And I'd like to think they learned from me. And I think those mm-hmm. are those moments that are going to like save, save the world, you know? Yeah. But see, again, there, there's an antecedent to all of this in the South. There was a, there were a lot of pigs. They, you didn't have yeah. to fence them. They, they pretty much ran wild. It mm-hmm. was the available meat. Um, mm-hmm. You eat what you have. It's no different yeah. than wild boar in Tuscany, you know. Uh, and that, that's how regional cuisines were built. Yeah. And these, and now when Ben goes down and sees Gwen and all those people, she always makes sure because now he, she only, she knows that he won't eat pork unless it's like a vi- like once in a million years. And now she will make a special dish for him that doesn't have pork in it because every oh, other single thing will have pork in it, which is how you can see how. But now you can. See, that's how connect how closely connected they have become to each other. And she does a lot of research on like food and civil rights movements and all this stuff. Um, this is just a huge, this is a, such an interest of mine of how like, you know, food and drink will really, is like I said, I love the social lubricants or how like people connecting, breaking bread together. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. a magical and Ben, ben does story circles, which is a whole other topic, but the, um, the, the ways that, that people can talk about stuff that otherwise they wouldn't be able to talk about when they have some mm-hmm. really good food and drink. Um, is a pretty crazy thing. But it's, it hits you at some emotional level. Yeah. It really does. I mean, I think of some meals I had when I was living overseas and that's the touchstone for a memory that goes on and on and on way beyond the food. You know, my, my, my favorite, well, my second favorite memory of East Berlin where I used to work a fair amount in the old days mm-hmm. when the wall was up, 
is after you got through Checkpoint Charlie, you know, which is like in a spy novel, they would put the mirror under the car and they'd, you know, <laughs> look into your trunk and under your seat. First thing I wanted to do was go to this place I knew under the elevated train, the, the S-Bahn, and get me a vice first, which is a white mm. veal sausage that was served yeah. on a napkin with a hard roll and some mustard. And mm. to me, that's East Berlin. I mean, yeah, I feel like I saw every... that on like an Anthony Bourdain, like that place. Like I remember there was a. Did you? I don't know. I don't know who it was. It was some Food Network thing, so it might have been yours. Where it was like, no, just, no, we never took the show vivid, to, to Berlin. Very vivid, um, like thing of of like going through Checkpoint Charlie and then going under the like overpass. Mm. Yeah, no, it was <laughs> the funniest thing was you know I was there the night it all opened, so oh, after. Wow after years of going through checkpoint charlie at two in the morning i walked through it with a crew and it was deserted whoa yeah it was it was remarkable yeah (laughs) really remarkable my my german teacher told me and he was living in the united states by that point he was german um he said that like nobody even knew like it just happened is that accurate like yeah uh, we were going to do nightly news from the wall that night because there had been a lot going on in a sequence of communist revolutions all of which i covered um so brokaw came over uh and we had a big setup in front of the brandenburg gate which may have helped motivate this but um at one point i was in the trailer given given the time difference Nightly would go on the air, I think at 1130 or midnight, somewhere around there. So at about nine at night, this cameraman came running in saying they're, they're leaving over the, he mentioned a bridge that was in, I think the British sector might've been French. And I saw, oh, come on, that's not happening. He rewound the tape and showed me and they were just streaming out. Uh, the pressure on East Germany and East Berlin at that point from the folks coming in from Czechoslovakia, from all of the upheaval going on, they finally just opened, the, uh, threw up their hands and said, screw it. You want to go? Go. Um, and it hit the fan. And the reason, yeah. by the way, remember pictures of all those Germans dancing on top of the wall? Yeah. You want to know, know how they got there? I ran a ladder to the wall so my crew could run up and shoot down. And then I had my ladder stolen, wrestled away from me, and half of Germany was on the top of the wall. Oh my god! So cool. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I'm exactly the age where it's like I wasn't really aware of it when it was happening, but everyone around me was, and so like growing up, it was this like big mystical event. Um, oh, that's so cool. Ah. Uh, I was, yeah, I used to be able to see um, a a chunk of the wall in Washington, D.C., in the museum. It's real, real sad that place closed. I'm Um, the only one who doesn't have a piece of the wall. Everybody at NBC (laughs) who wasn't there somehow ended up with a piece of the wall. have a warehouse with just, like, chunks of the wall at this point. (laughs) Well, and and there's a misconception there. People were not knocking it down that night. That that happened quite a while later. But, um, yeah, I, I do not have my piece of the wall. Never got one. I have this image of there literally being some warehouse in Germany with, yeah. like, just well, chunks. <laughs> well, people uh, definitely must had large, large bits of it. You used to be able to buy postcards with, like, little chunks of it. So yeah. somebody was making yeah. a good Supposedly. project. Off of or it. somebody went into a garage and graffitied some cement. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It's that's, you can make a pretty penny that way. Um, I, I remember like they have a piece of it in like the Holocaust museum at, uh, the, like the, what do you call it? Washington DC, the the, the city. Um, yeah, 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 that city. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself that (laughs) that's where I I was began my life as a, as a dangerously close to conspiracy theorists. Um, this is different, but I, I, I feel like that piece isn't real. I feel like there's a bunch of pieces in museums that are just simply not real. To be fair, you don't want to, you don't want to learn how many art pieces in museums are just simply not real at all because it will depress you. And I wish I did not know. I have no idea how to wrap this up. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you great. so much. Thanks for stopping by. Well, yeah, thank um, you. It's been a delight. Yeah. My book, Food Americana, is 
on Amazon. And I have a radio show called Martini Music that's in about a dozen markets around the country. If it's in yours, look for it. I don't know uh, off the top of my head where I am, but it's music of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and I'm very proud of it. Um, but let me repeat again. The book is Food Americana. Uh, my daughter got an MFA in Colum at Columbia. It took seven years. I paid for it. Please buy my book. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Oh, thank you so yeah. much again. It's It's been so much fun. Well, you guys are my new best friends. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for listening to D-Listers of History. If you enjoyed yourself, be sure to subscribe and drop us a review on whatever platform you listen on. A huge thank you to April Keys for the use of the song Misfit from her album Mountain View. You can find her on all the various social media platforms and on Bandcamp. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at D List of History, no hyphens. We're also going to be starting a YouTube channel soon, so keep an eye out for that. A big shout out to the folks supporting us on Patreon. If you want to support us and get access to all sorts of exclusive content, including some of the conversation that was cut out of this episode because it was kind of off topic. But if you want to hear Issa and David go on about museum politics, come and join us on Patreon. Uh, you can subscribe for, I think it's like $3 a month, and it really makes a big difference in being able to offset the cost of this. All this and more can be found on our website, deliciousofhistory.com. Again, no hyphens. Uh, and also on our website, you can find access to our new merch store, which is very exciting. Um, and we're so happy to have you. We come out with new episodes every other week we're going to try for this season. We'll see how that goes. So the next episode will be out October 16th, and it will be an interview with the author Charlie Allison about his new book about Nestor Makhno, the Ukrainian anarchist. So that's a really fun interview, so definitely tune in. And now for an episode-relevant audio drama. <laughs> Yo quiero Taco Bell. Now you can get two tacos for just 99 cents. Want some?